All right, welcome to the show, y'all. Forgive my voice yet again. I'm a little bit sick, but we're going to carry on full full speed ahead. So a lot of stuff to get to today. Mehdi Hassan did a beautiful segment, ripping the mask off of APAC once and for all. I mean, we all know their role in U.S. politics, but he's going to lay it out in detail with a gargantuan number of facts, and it becomes undeniable. So we'll talk about that. We have a U.S. congressman steps up and says, I will personally hand Netanyahu an ICC arrest warrant when he comes to give his speech in Congress. Mega based. Later on, we'll get to uh, one of Trump's VP hopefuls it just absolutely crumbled under basic CNN questions. Um, Donald Trump repeatedly went after Bill Maher and hammered him again and again. That one's fun for a number of reasons. And then um, later on, Jesus Christ, this new video that just came out that details all of the extreme weather events that happened over the past week, absolutely devastating. I mean, we're basically in climate Armageddon. We have scorching heat that is just shattering records all over the place. I'm sure many of you have experienced it within the past week or so. We'll talk about that. And um, a CNN, or excuse me, a, a MAGA caller on C-SPAN gets X-rated about Trump. Okay, that should be interesting. So without further ado, let's dive into it. So um, and subscribe to the channel. Hook a brother up with a sub. It helps massively. It costs you nothing. We're trying to get to 10 million subs. It'll take a while, but we build it one at a time. Anyway, so, um, sub for, uh, uh, sub for out of love for me doing the show, even though it feels like I have 17 knives that are poking my throat as we speak. I don't know what I have. I don't know if it's COVID or strep throat or just a regular cold, but uh, talking is actually kind of difficult. But anyway, so sub out of sympathy, if nothing else. All right, so Mehdi Hassan goes on his uh, show here on Zateo, his new media outlet. And um, man, he is going to take APAC to the cleaners, bro. And this is the kind of segment that we should be getting everywhere in mainstream media. And of course we don't. Let's dive in. Picture this. An official with one of Washington, D.C.'s top lobbying groups sits down for dinner with a journalist. The official is asked about... The time their organization was caught on tape bragging about cutting a deal with the White House and whether it's impacted their group's influence on Capitol Hill. The lobbyist smiles, points to a napkin and says, proudly, in 24 hours we could have the signatures of 70 senators on this napkin. Now, that statement alone could be considered a huge scandal, especially if that lobbying group was, say, the gun lobby, the NRA, or Big Pharma, or Big Oil. There'd be headlines everywhere about the power of special interests and big lobbies, outrage from constituents and the media. A lot of Democrats would be lining up to take shots at that lobbyist. But believe it or not, that story I just told you is real, it happened, and yet it's barely ever mentioned. Because it wasn't an NRA official who said it, or a rep for Big Oil or Big Pharma or even the AARP. It happened back in 2005, and the quote about the napkin was from an official with AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, perhaps the most powerful and famous or infamous member of America's broad pro-Israel lobby. And today, we need to talk about AIPAC. Because despite over 70% of Americans saying that lobbyists in general have too much influence, despite APAC's shameless bragging about their brazen power and influence over our elected officials, their seemingly un unlimited access to the people in charge, we just don't talk about APAC that much. Not in our mainstream media, for sure. And look, I get it. There are some very dangerous conspiracy theories out there about rich Jews controlling the government, the Jewish lobby, the puppeteers, the secret cabal that's really running the country. Anti-Semitic tropes and conspiracies that have led to hate and persecution of Jewish communities throughout history. These days, many of them are being perpetuated by Republicans who are hyper-obsessed with Jewish billionaire George Soros, who they blame for funding everything from the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville to the hush money trial against Donald Trump. Uh, and look, anti-Semitic tropes about rich Jews, whether they're Soros or the Rothschilds or the Jewish community in general, should absolutely be condemned. But that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about AIPAC. We're talking about a self-described powerful lobbying group, one that brags about its influence, puts out literature claiming that its conferences get more members of Congress than any other event bar the State of the Union, one that openly spends millions of dollars trying to unseat pro-Palestinian members of Congress. A group that in no way should be associated with bigoted conspiracy theories about Jewish space lasers or Jewish financiers, but absolutely should be associated with the wider, corrupt, anti-democratic role played by lobby groups in general, and absolutely should be rejected in the same way that we reject, say, the NRA. And just have a listen to one of their top targets, APAC's top targets this year, New York Congressman Jamal Bowman, who currently faces a primary challenge from George Latimer, a pro-Israel Democrat backed by APAC. Here is Jamal Bowman speaking with Zateo's Cynthia Nixon just last week. APAC represents special interests in politics, big money in politics, um, trying to buy elections. They represent all of that. When we win, inshallah, we show the world that you can challenge power and win, right, in a big way. And that's what's at stake. 
And indeed, the stakes are high in the primary race for New York's 16th congressional district, where AIPAC has already spent over $10 million trying to unseat Bowman, making it the most that AIPAC has ever spent on a race. Mm. Bowman is, of course, not the only one AIPAC is going after. According to Politico, AIPAC is expected to spend $100 million this election year as they specifically take aim at pro-Palestinian progressives within the Democratic Party. And remember, AIPAC is actually quite successful when it comes to targeting and taking out members of Congress they disagree with the ones they dislike. Take the 2022 midterms, for example, when AIPAC helped defeat Congress's most progressive Jewish member, Andy Levin, with their super PAC spending over $4 million against him in his primary. Of course, AIPAC's same super PAC, United Democracy Project, a rather inconspicuous name for a nakedly and hardline pro-Israel group, is now running attack ads against Bowman, just like they did against Levin, with many of those ads having nothing to do with Israel. They don't mention Israel. Funny that. Instead, the ads accuse Bowman of being unable to compromise, even with President Biden, citing Bowman's refusal to vote for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Now, maybe, maybe APAC could have gone around preaching about the virtues of bipartisanship, of reaching out across the aisle 10 or 20 years ago, back when the organisation was widely considered to be bipartisan. But today that bipartisanship is long gone. APAC panders more and more to the far right. In fact, APAC's targeting of progressives has turned them into the perfect vessel for GOP megadonors trying to kill progressive policies. And looky here, earlier this month, Politico reported that APAC has now become the biggest source of Republican donations in the most competitive Democratic primaries, making it a clear case of GOP meddling. Now, APAC would say that they're simply fighting off the extremists in Congress, a classic racist dog whistle they love to invoke against the non-white members of the squad. We've seen them use this before in their 2021 attack ad against Congresswoman Ilhan Omar when they told voters to stand against terrorists. Ah, uh, yes, because calling out legitimate war crimes oh. while being a black Muslim woman must make you pro-terrorism, right? I don't even think the Democrats are smart enough to understand that APAC is just a right-wing group now. Like, that's it. They're just a right-wing group. They back Republicans. They want Republicans to win. They will back Republican-like Democratic candidates in Democratic races. Like, so you're shooting yourself in the foot when you snuggle up to them. Because they will turn on you, they will stab you in the back. So, but Democrats are too dumb to understand this. Just like Biden is too dumb to understand Netanyahu wants Trump to win, and he's going to knife you in the back repeatedly, as he's been doing. You're not having gentlemen's disagreements about various issues. He's purposely trying to sabotage you to get Trump elected. So Democrats think, oh, we snuggle up to Israel, everything will really work out well. No, anybody with eyes and ears can see what's happening here. Anybody can see it. The truth is that APAC couldn't care less about fighting actual extremism. Quite the opposite, they're actually supporting it. In the aftermath of January the 6th, during the 2022 midterms, APAC chose to endorse over 100 members of Congress who voted against certifying the 2020 election results, who chose to perpetuate Donald Trump's baseless election conspiracy theories, even after those lies had inspired a violent insurrection from, Amer from America's own right-wing extremists, or as the FBI likes to call them, domestic terrorists. Hmm, so much for a united democracy. Oh, and just in case you think the people who dislike or are opposed to APAC are all brown Muslims like me, I would remind you that one of their most vocal critics is another pro-Israel lobbying group, a more liberal, more moderate pro-Israel lobbying group, J Street, which has accused APAC of undermining American democracy, as well as the, quote, true interest of American Jews and pro-Israel Americans who APAC often claims to represent. By the way, on the subject of who APAC represents, again, we have to be careful here. APAC consists of Americans, not Israelis, and we have to avoid the dual loyalty trope when it comes to American Jews. Having said that, APAC does often tend to take the Israeli government line over the American government line. For example, when it came to President Obama's Iran deal, and have done so for decades. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the prominent, influential, very respected Democratic Senator William Fulbright, the longest serving chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in US history, he said he wanted to see APAC register as a foreign agent, but it didn't go anywhere. Now, today, thankfully, some progressives in the Democratic Party are finally starting to take action to fight back against the influence of APAC, against this Republican front group. This past March, over 20 advocacy organizations, including Jewish Voice for Peace and Justice Democrats, launched a coalition called Reject APAC, which says its goal is to defend the members of Congress who are being targeted by this pro-Israel organization. In 2022, squad member Summer Lee in Pennsylvania was successful in fending off a primary challenge from an APAC-backed candidate. And remember, Nina Turner went down because of the APAC money funding her opponent. So, it's very powerful. And George Latimer is just a Republican running as a Democrat to take out Jamal Bowman. And George Latimer has way more money than Jamal Bowman, even though Jamal Bowman is the incumbent. And the district is very wealthy, and there's a very big Jewish population there. So, I don't think people truly understand how deleterious the impact of APAC is in our politics. And just how much... Um, they are just a right-wing group, right? So 
Summer Lee being able to fend them off was awesome, but Israel's coming both guns blazing for anybody who even utters a peep of disagreement with Netanyahu and the Israeli government. Whether squad member Jamal Bowman in 2024 is similarly successful in his New York district, we shall see. Meanwhile, sadly, shamefully, inexcusably, the majority of elected Democrats in Congress continue to remain silent on AIPAC, and many of them continue to take money from AIPAC and its proxies, even as the GOP uses the organization to interfere in Democratic Party primaries, even as AIPAC itself just backs the Netanyahu government line here in Washington, D.C. Isn't it weird that we can criticize every lobby group on Capitol Hill, from the gun lobby to the oil lobby, but not the pro-Israel lobby, not AIPAC, not the group currently defending a genocide in the Middle East, not the group currently flooding Democratic primaries with Republican money. No, they're off limits, or you're an anti-Semite. Mm. Now, by the way, to that last point, I'm going to give you a perfect example of this. This is their trick. If you criticize Netanyahu, or you criticize the government of Israel, or you criticize the ethnic cleansing or the genocide happening against Palestinians in Gaza, they immediately call you an anti-Semite. Joe Biden got in on that fun recently, accusing people of anti-Semitism. Look at this. I'm appalled by the scenes outside of Adas Torah Synagogue in Los Angeles. Intimidating Jewish congregants is dangerous, unconscionable, anti-Semitic, and un-American. Americans have a right to peaceful protest, but blocking access to a house of worship and engaging in violence is never acceptable. So if you knew nothing about the situation and you just read that, you're like, oh my God, there was an anti-Semitic mob that was going after Jews at a synagogue in Los Angeles. Here's the reality. This wasn't a haphazard protest blocking a place of worship. There was a sale of Palestinian land being held there. Note, on the other hand, Biden has not said anything about news of a Texas woman attacking a Palestinian mother and trying to drown her two kids. Nothing about anti-Palestinian hatred or anti-Muslim hatred or anti-Arab hatred, even when the stories pile up one after the other after the other on that. Nothing on that. Nothing on that. But you do a bullshit, fake cry of anti-Semitism at pretending like there's an unruly mob just spewing their hatred for Jews at this synagogue when the reality of the situation is the hatred spewing event was in the synagogue. They were selling land that wasn't there, theirs. They were selling Palestinian land. And people went to protest that as they should. So, man, what a loathsome scumbag. And by the way, to get back to the main point here, this is APAC's trick. This is what they do. Everybody's an anti-Semite. Your mom's an anti-Semite. Your grandma's an anti-Semite. Your dog's an anti-Semite. Your cat's an anti-Semite. Your lizard's an anti-Semite. Because you criticize Netanyahu, or, you know, you criticize the Israeli government, or you're against a theocracy, you're against an ethnostate, you're against illegal settlers in the West Bank, you're against bombing hospitals and schools and UN buildings and uh, factories and homes in Gaza. You're an anti-Semite, you're an anti-Semite, you're an anti-Semite. That's the trick they do. That's all they have. That's it. And idiots like Biden and the corporate Democrats still have not picked up on this. Um, they're still willing to take millions and millions of dollars from APAC and do their bidding. And how does that manifest? It manifests in the majority of the uh, elected Democrats in this country still being sycophantic to Israel, even though the Israel lobby is just a Republican lobby and wants to stab every Democrat in the back and get the Republicans elected. It is... Honestly, the worst case scenario you could possibly imagine. But Mehdi Hassan did a great job exposing the reality of the Israel lobby in APAC. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.